Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Lee Austin. I'm one of His Majesty's inspectors, and I'm also the acting national director for education. And we have a, a top team of, of HMI here to share their insights and thoughts with you um, um, tonight. I'll go through who else we have on the call in, in, a, in a moment. Um, but obviously, tonight's webinar continues our programme of, of schools webinars. Um, focusing on issues that we know particularly from inspection, but also from our engagement with people like yourselves out on the out on the ground, they want to hear more about. Tonight's webinar focuses on how we can support secondary aged pupils with their reading, and that builds on a publication that you'll hear about in a moment um, that we published a few months ago now, um, but obviously the, the messages are still really, really important. Um, this is our part of our commitment, actually, to ensure that you hear directly from us. We know that there are often lots of people who want to come along and share their thoughts with you about inspection and Ofsted and what may or may not happen. And indeed, some of that can cost quite a great deal. And obviously, we wanted to commit to saying, actually, if you're going to hear about Ofsted, then it's best to hear directly from Ofsted itself. And also, we've got um, all of us here this, this evening to talk to you about reading as a specific focus. So I'll just introduce Jonathan. Um, and it's fair to say that we're all, as you can see, His Majesty's inspectors, which means we've had a background in education. We've been head teachers, teachers. So we're, and we still regularly inspect alongside some of our other kind of roles within Ofsted. As I said, I'm the acting national director. Jonathan is the acting deputy director for schools and early education. You have Kirsty, who is a senior HMI in our curriculum unit. Kirsty has led on a great deal of our work around reading over recent years. So she's our kind of specialist in that area. We also have Ian. Ian is one of our senior HMI out in, in regions, senior HMI for schools. And we also have Claire, Claire Jones, who is one of our specialist advisors in our policy quality and training team. So the, the last slide before I hand over to colleagues who are going to take you through the, very, the, the precise detail. As I said earlier, you know, the, the main where you can um, secure some of the resources, any resources actually, is through our official website. We have published over recent months quite a lot around reading, so please go and have a look at some of those blogs that we publish from time to time. And obviously there's also a facility there for you to get in contact with us if you have any um, queries or questions outside of this webinar. And actually we're really interested to hear from you about what the next round of themes should be. As I said, we're committed to putting these, these programs of webinars together. So if there's anything that across the summer term you particularly want to hear from us about, then please drop us a, drop us a message and we'll make sure that we build that in um, to our planning. So I'm going to hand over now to Jonathan, who's just going to take you through the, the, um, the overview of the session. And just to say, we will now turn cameras off so you can give your full attention to the content, but we'll, you'll see us again at the end when we come back on screen. Um, for the question and answer session. So uh, welcome to everybody and over to Jonathan for the overview of the session. Thanks Lee and uh, a very good afternoon stroke evening to you all. Thanks for joining us today. We're very grateful that you've made some time for us. So in this webinar we'll explore what research and inspection tells us about a high quality reading curriculum for pupils in secondary schools who need to catch up with reading. We'll also share the implications for assessment and pedagogy and how we evaluate this aspect of a school's work on inspection. And through this session, we'll draw upon research from our English Research Review, our report about struggling readers in secondary schools and our education recovery reports. And of course, insights from our inspection findings. And if you haven't already had a look at these two documents, you can see on your screen here, they're available to download um, at gov.uk and really easy to find. You can Google either of those, Research Review, Ofsted English, or now the whole school is reading and you can find those easily online. So a bit of background to start us off. Our recovery publications told us that many secondary schools have had to place an increased focus on helping pupils to catch up in reading so as a result of you know, disruption to learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And leaders have told us that many more pupils are not reading well enough for their age and these weak reading skills are affecting pupils' ability to access the learning across the, the wider curriculum. So it's therefore critical that readings are priority for schools and inspectors if we're to prevent pupils from falling any further behind with their education. And, and we know that reading is fundamental to educational success. 
It's of course the gateway to learning across the curriculum and it's key to pupils future academic achievement and well-being. However, while secondary schools have noticed this issue worsening as a result of the pandemic, it has and is being, you know, it's been an ongoing issue. Year six reading outcomes tell us that more than one in four pupils are not at the expected standard with reading when they start secondary school. And research also tells us that it's important to get reading right from the start. And this is the reason we carry out a reading deep dive in all schools with primary age pupils. So on this slide are some of the weaknesses that we, you know, we sometimes find on inspection. I'll work through the bullets here. So schools don't always have a systematic approach to identify which pupils on entry to year seven are having difficulties with reading. And where assessment does happen, it's not always helpful in identifying what pupils are struggling with. For example, you know, whether they use phonics to read on, on familiar words and which GPCs, that's grapheme, phoning, correspondences, they have or haven't grasped. And a lack of identification or further assessment then leads to pupils either not receiving tailored support or pupils not receiving support at all. So leaders are sometimes unsure whether they should allow pupils to miss other lessons as they fear that it will be narrowing a pupil's curriculum. Now, it's essential that reading is prioritised so pupils can access the full curriculum. So not prioritising reading is limiting the curriculum which pupils can access. And some leaders are you know, managing this in, in, in very kind of creative ways in school to make sure that priorita but the prioritisation of reading continues. So some examples that we've seen are perhaps rotating the subjects that are missed, um, making use of English lessons to catch up with reading, perhaps using registration time or time before the start of school. And leaders, of course, also need to make sure that any reading intervention is effective enough so that pupils can catch up quickly and soon benefit from participation in the full curriculum. And two further points, schools don't always have a team of staff, including leaders, with the expertise needed to deliver additional support for pupils. And this, of course, then results in leaders not being able to check that the support is having the desired impact. Just having a reading intervention isn't enough. Leaders need to make sure it's successful in enabling pupils to quickly catch up. And it needs to be an urgent priority to enable pupils to access the full curriculum. OK, so for this next session now, I'll hand over to Kirsty, who will take us through some of these principles of a high quality reading curriculum in more detail. Kirsty, over to you. Thanks, Jonathan. So in this part of the session, we're going to consider what that high quality reading curriculum might include. So let's first think what it is that pupils entering secondary school need to be able to do and to fulfil the demands of that secondary school curriculum they need to be able to read age appropriate texts fluently because pupils who can't read well enough are not able to access the curriculum and that can lead to them becoming disadvantaged for life. So if we think then about what it takes to become a fluent reader, pupils need to be able to read words both accurately and automatically. So these are the two main components of fluent word reading. Let's think about accuracy. So pupils need to be able to decode unfamiliar words by saying the sounds that correspond to the letters and then blending those sounds together. Automatic word reading is when pupils can read familiar words accurately, silently and speedily. And the right sort of practice, as well as the right amount of practice, will then enable them to read both accurately and automatically. And by rereading words again and again, pupils then increase the bank of words that are familiar to them, those words that can be read at a glance. And it may appear that pupils are reading these words, um, have perhaps memorised them by sight, but actually, if they've been taught phonics as their go-to strategy for reading unfamiliar words, then these words will have first been processed through that sounding out and blending process. And the reason that's so important is that there's no limit to the amount of words that pupils can read if they've first been processed through phonics. So accurate word reading starts with understanding the alphabetic code, that the letters on the page represent the sounds in spoken words. And phonics represents the body of knowledge needed for word reading. And it's therefore not a pedagogy, 
extensive research shows how important, te how important teaching systematic synthetic phonics is until children can decode automatically. Because without this knowledge, pupils won't have the means to read unfamiliar words. And this is true for all pupils who are learning to read, including those who have special educational needs. And we know it can be sometimes wrongly assumed that when older pupils are struggling with reading, that they must need something different to phonics if it hasn't already worked. The problem can often be seen as due to the child's difficulty rather than simply as a knowledge deficit. And study upon study shows that children who have been diagnosed with developmental conditions, they learn to decode words by relying on the same processes as all readers do. But what is clear though, is that there will be some pupils that need more practice than others to secure that important phonic knowledge. This doesn't mean phonics doesn't work or that other strategies should be used instead or alongside. And for pupils who have fallen behind their peers with reading, including those who have SEND, teachers might need to think differently about the pedagogy choices. So as an example, these pupils are likely to benefit from being taught in a smaller group, which is free from distractions, and perhaps with the knowledge broken down into smaller steps with increased repetition and overlearning. And older pupils, of course, may well need more age appropriate resources. So the important point here is that the curriculum itself doesn't change. It's the activities and resources, those pedagogy choices that might. And you might be wondering at this point about comprehension. And, and of course, it's actually back to those two, two key components of fluent word reading again, because without accurate and automatic word reading, pupils reading will be so labored that they'll struggle to understand the meaning, even if they understand the words. And that's because working memory overload makes it very difficult for pupils to focus on making sense of what they read. But once pupils become accurate and automatic with reading, their working memory is then able to focus on comprehension. And if they are understanding the meaning of what they're reading, then they'll be able to comprehend the text. So it's together that these elements make a fluent reader. That fluency is the bedrock from which pupils can then infer and make connections and be able to analyse what they read. And in Goff and Tunma's simple view of reading that we can see here, we see the two distinct aspects of reading. Word reading, that accuracy and automaticity we've just heard about, taught through phonics, and language comprehension. Pupils need to develop both their language comprehension and their word reading if they're going to be able to read with comprehension and get to that top right quadrant. So reading with comprehension is the product of both, neither therefore being sufficient on its own. Something important here to say though is that both of the elements need teaching separately in the early stages. So word reading through phonics and language comprehension through reading and discussing a wide range of books and studying a broad curriculum. That background knowledge that's acquired from studying a broad curriculum should not be underestimated here. It's also worth noting that pupils who are still struggling to read fluently by the time they get to secondary school, they're very likely to be in that bottom left quadrant, where not only is their word reading poor, but also their language comprehension too. And that's because the impact of their poor word reading over a number of years will mean that they'll have read far less than their peers and therefore they'll have picked up less language and vocabulary knowledge, that background knowledge in its entirety from reading and their other wider studies. So now we're going to see some examples of what happens when there's a lack of accuracy or automaticity and how that might play out in secondary schools. So starting with an accuracy example here, there may be some pupils that manage just about to get by in key stage two. Perhaps they've memorized some common words by sight and they might apply some guessing strategies to some other longer words. But actually what happens is these pupils often flounder when they get to secondary school and the demands on their reading are greater and their memory for whole words becomes overloaded. And the important point is that they have no strategy for dealing with unfamiliar words. So if pupils are having difficulty with reading longer unfamiliar words, they still haven't mastered their phonics code. They don't have the phonics knowledge they need to decode the unfamiliar words. 
And these pupils often struggle to read subject specific vocabulary, such as the words on the slide, which a pupil might encounter in science. So difficulty in reading those polysyllabic words is often an indicator of insecure phonic knowledge, whether that's in identifying the grapheme phoneme correspondences or with blending them to be able to read words. So now onto another example, and this time we're going to put ourselves in the position of a pupil who's not yet reading automatically. So in a moment, you're going to see some text appearing on the screen. Just have a read of it. And this text is going to appear at the speed that a pupil without automatic reading might read the words. I'm now going to ask you some comprehension questions about what you've just read. How far did they climb? Where did the characters find themselves? At what point did they first see Pemberley House? Where were they standing when they first saw the house? And how did the author describe the road? Now, you may have found that surprisingly hard. Perhaps you got the first question right easily enough. After that, you might have found yourself guessing or even giving up by maybe question three or four. And, and obviously the constraints here are highly artificial, but reading like this allows us to glimpse the lived experience of an estimated 20% you know, plus of children in secondary, in secondary schools. And if this is in any way similar to your experience of reading, it's almost certainly not something you'd want to do for pleasure. So this activity exemplifies why it's so important that pupils learn to read fluently so that they can make sense of what they read and they can access that full curriculum. And we know that reading, of course, is really crucial for increasing the breadth of children's vocabulary and that academic writing in particular provides exposure to complex vocabulary and ideas that really support academic success. But there will be many pupils who are just not reading fluently and can, can't quite manage with the age appropriate reading materials that they encounter in class. These pupils can often read accurately, but actually because they read so little, either for pleasure or regularly in lessons, that they don't build their fluency progressively to be able to read increasingly demanding texts with automaticity. And that means they often struggle to get through the sheer volume of reading that's required in lessons. And this sometimes actually results in the situation getting worse for them. So perhaps if their teachers notice that they don't have the same reading stamina as their peers, they might be given less text or a text that's been simplified or even video input instead, because that's more accessible. And of course, what that group needs is more reading practice of age appropriate materials, because that's what will develop their automaticity. And in fact, what they can often end up getting is less practice than their peers meaning they don't have readiness for academic texts that are required for future study. So to summarise then, what makes an effective reading curriculum? Well, our English research review suggests that as successful reading comprehension requires fluent reading and an understanding of the language read, then an effective reading curriculum focuses on providing pupils with the knowledge that they need for comprehension. And it develops their fluency by ensuring that pupils know the phonics code and read large amounts of text. And a reading curriculum is supported by the careful choice of increasingly challenging texts. And I'm now going to hand over to Ian, who's going to take us through the next part of the session. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to start by talking to you about the assessment of reading. So there are two main things in consideration here. Um, assessment should obviously check which pupils are finding reading difficult um, but also really importantly which aspects of reading are not secure 
Okay, so, so how might we do this? When establishing which pupil to find in reading difficult, um, information passed on from one key stage to the next will help to identify this. So results from reading tests help to rank pupils and so identify those who are behind the majority of their peers, for example. And, and this is useful information, but it's only a starting point. So reading scores, reading ages, SAT scores, scores in phonic screening checks will not tell teachers precisely what aspects of reading that pupils are actually struggling with. And many reading tests check reading comprehension, but they're not specifically designed to identify whether pupils can read accurately and automatically, as Kirsty was explaining. And what might appear at, fir at a first glance a reading comprehension issue may well be a lack of fluency uh, causing working memory overload and, and, and thus preventing people from being able to focus on understanding what they read. And it's fluent reading that allows for effective comprehension. So therefore, what is most important is what happens next. And this is really finding out what precisely pupils are struggling with to identify the knowledge deficit. And to start with, staff might listen to pupils reading aloud, for example. And this gives an indication of how well pupils are reading age appropriate books with fluency. And for pupils struggling with accuracy, the most helpful assessments will be those from a school's chosen phonics intervention program, because this will determine the extent of pupils' phonic knowledge and skills, and, and also to identify those precise gaps uh, of knowledge that we, we just discussed. And, and those specific gaps can then be addressed through any additional teaching. So touching on pedagogy choices for, for teaching pupils who need to catch up. Okay, the, there are some implications um, from what we've heard when it comes to prioritising additional teaching for struggling readers. And you can see on the left of the slide that we can see the components of successful reading comprehension. Um, and this being fluency in word reading, so where you can see accuracy and automaticity circled, but also, as Kirsty was saying, that language comprehension. And just as we saw in the simple view of reading. So what we need to think about is which components are not secure and how we can best secure that knowledge. And here, the first priority should always be reading fluency if this is not secure. Because not only does fluency allow the working memory to focus on comprehending a text, but once pupils can read fluently, they can increase their knowledge of language through their independent reading as well. So the accuracy comes first. So if pupils aren't reading accurately, they will then need phonics. And once they are reading accurately, they will need lots of practice to help build that automaticity in reading. And this will often involve reading aloud to an adult who can monitor their reading. So to secure pupils' word reading takes staff with the right expertise, and it's difficult to, and this can be difficult to provide in the classroom where others are learning something else. So it's therefore likely to need either intervention or additional support out of class or to be delivered to a group or a class of pupils uh, who need to secure the same knowledge as part of their English teaching. Now, we do know that some schools prioritise time in English lessons. So, for example, this might take place at the start of um, the first term in year seven, so that pupils quickly gain the prerequisite knowledge to access the expected English curriculum alongside their peers. But what if pupils don't have a strong understanding of language and, and how is this knowledge best secured? Well, most pupils who are not reading age appropriate books fluently will have a more limited understanding of language than their peers, as Kirsty said just now. And these are unlikely to choose to read independently and therefore they're going to be reliant on gaining knowledge of language through lessons across the curriculum rather than also gaining it from their own independent reading. And this is the Matthew effect, where basically the rich get rich and the poor get poorer, unfortunately. That said, it would be a mistake in most cases to focus any additional teaching or intervention just on the development of language. And this is because pupils understanding of language can still be developed while they secure the word reading. And they will gain knowledge of language through studying a broad curriculum including having an age-appropriate text read to them as part of the English curriculum 
And this is so they can benefit from the discussions, but also broaden their understanding of the vocabulary and concepts that they contain. So, so in this way, when the word reading catches up, they will have the understanding of language needed to comprehend what they read. And I just add to that by saying, developing knowledge of language is a crucial part of the curriculum in every subject. So therefore, this component of knowledge will be being addressed in all lessons in all subjects. So to focus on language as an intervention, which takes pupils out of their usual classes, may not necessarily add to their language development any better than if they'd remained in those lessons in the first place. So that's, that's an important point. And of course, there may be pupils with SEND who need to access speech and language therapy uh, as additional support as well. Okay, so we, we do know that most pupils will catch up if they have the right quality and the right quantity of practice. So we know that these, these things are both essential. So, so pupils who are behind with word reading may well need to miss some of the lessons while they receive intensive support to, to enable this catch up. And reading should be prioritised to allow pupils to access the full curriculum, because we know if they can't read, that's going to have an implication in terms of that access. The amount of practice needed will differ for each pupil, as we've heard. And just like people need a different amount of driving lessons for the same knowledge to become automatic. So most pupils catch up with intensive additional support. And it will probably involve small group or one to one support free from distractions, but with plenty of repetition to the point of overlearning uh, to secure what they've been taught. And we know that some pupils, including those who may have SEND, may need more practice than others and that that lack of practice can lead to pupils falling further behind their peers and actually sometimes being identified as having a special educational need when actually they just haven't had the amount of practice needed to secure their knowledge of the phonics code. Now where phonics teaching is required, a systematic synthetic phonics program should be used with care to make sure that resources are age appropriate and it's really important, as we've heard, that staff are trained so they have the expertise to support older pupils who have fallen behind with reading. And it will take more than a keen English leader or a well-informed SENCO with a knowledge of teaching systematic synthetic phonics to make sure that pupils who need to catch up quickly are given the right tools to do so. It's likely that a secondary school will need a team of well-trained staff as part of a coordinated approach to effectively support these pupils. Okay, so if we touch on evaluating reading on inspection and what will actually be looked at in this respect. So, so we do know that in terms of how we evaluate reading on inspection, um, and you can see on the slide there, the, the paragraph 214 of the handbook. And this reminds us really of the importance of focusing on how well all pupils learn to read. Uh, particularly those who are disadvantaged or those who have SEND. And this focus includes those pupils, of course, in secondary schools as well. OK, and we added a further paragraph to the School Inspection Handbook in September um, in the light of COVID-19, because we know, obviously, the impact of COVID-19 on, on reading uh, added to the difficulty. And this paragraph is, is followed by the early reading evaluation criteria, and many, many of those criteria are relevant for older pupils who, who remain in the early stages of reading. OK, so there are three questions on the slide. And these are the sort of questions that inspect, inspectors will consider to determine how well reading is prioritised to allow those pupils who need to catch up to access the full curriculum offer. So I'll just give you a moment to, to have a read of those questions. OK. So, so as, as we've said, we know that reading is an integral part of learning in, in all subjects. So therefore, all inspectors will be alert to reading in all parts of deep dives in all subjects um, that we choose. So, for example, lesson visits provide an opportunity to, you know, for inspectors to evaluate pupils reading and the impact that this has on them being able to access the subject curriculum. We know that virtually all schools will have pupils in need of additional support with reading and the lead inspector will use the telephone conversation the day before inspection to find out what's in place and to make sure that we speak to the right people on inspection. It may be the responsibility of an English leader or it could be the SENCO or it, or it could be somebody else with this responsibility. 
And because of this, when we evaluate the quality of additional support, an inspector may do this as part of a deep dive in English, but also it, it might be more appropriate in other routine activities, such as when we're meeting with the SENCO to do, do these activities. And that, of course, will depend from school to school and from inspection to inspection. There's not an early reading deep dive in secondary schools as there is with in all primary schools, but evaluating support for struggling readers in secondary is more likely to cut across a range of subject deep dives and routine inspection activities. OK, I'm now going to pass back over to Jonathan uh, to share back some of our key messages from the session today. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Kirsty. OK, everyone, let's uh, let's summarise those points that we've heard over the last few slides. So in terms of uh, you know, curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, to read fluently, pupils need both accuracy and automaticity. And once pupils are able to read a text fluently, their working memory is freed up to focus on comprehending what they're reading. So knowing the alphabetic code, that the letters on the page represent the sounds in spoken language underpins fluent word reading. So phonics gives pupils the knowledge and skills to read words accurately. It's therefore a body of knowledge, not a pedagogy. And because of that, pupils who can't read accurately need to be taught phonics. So the curriculum, knowing the alphabetic code, is the same for all pupils. It's the pedagogy that might change. For example, you know, teaching in smaller groups, uh, whether you know, perhaps free from distractions, and, and with lots and lots of repetition. Assessment's really important in identifying not only if pupils are struggling with reading, but more importantly, what knowledge precisely that they are struggling with. And this makes sure that additional teaching can be targeted effectively. For example, for pupils who can't read accurately, teaching phonics has got to be the priority. Some pupils will be able to read accurately, but read too slowly to make sense of what they read. And these pupils need practice to build their automaticity and increase the bank of words they can read, if you like, at a glance. They need to be reading often, including reading aloud, so that an adult can monitor their reading. Becoming a fluent reader always comes down to having the right quality and quantity of practice. Quality teaching by staff who are trained and with enough quantity of practice to secure the learning, given that some pupils need much more practice than others. So additional teaching should be given enough priority to make sure that pupils catch up quickly, given the impact on being able to access the whole curriculum, remember. So fluency should be the priority for any additional teaching rather than language comprehension. So pupils can get reading and be able to develop their understanding of language through studying a broad curriculum and their own wider reading. And as we heard from Ian in terms of inspection, well, inspectors will evaluate how our reading is prioritised so that pupils can access the full curriculum. There'll be a focus on support for pupils in the early stages of learning to read and those who are not yet reading age appropriate text fluently. And to make the evaluation, inspectors will gather evidence from a range of subject deep dives and by exploring additional teaching for pupils who may have fallen behind. OK, we'll now bring things together in some questions and uh, we'll, we'll pop our, our cameras back on for this bit everybody so bear with us for a moment we had several questions submitted to us before the webinar which was super and we've had lots more popped into the chat bar today so what i'm going to do is sort of have a look across all the questions that we've had and draw out the most common themes so the first question um, that captures a lot of what people have said both before the webinar and and during the delivery today is around um, what whole school initiatives are effective or are most effective? So, Jonathan, do you want to answer yeah. that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Claire. It's a really helpful one. I guess it, it also ties together all those summary points that I, I, I covered on the last few slides. I guess there are three really important things to say there in terms of whole school initiatives. One is you know, stating the obvious, if you like, reading, giving reading, you know, that real priority so that it's everybody's business. And in fact, you'll hear us saying that when we talk in a subsequent uh, we webinar about attendance, it's important that reading's every everyone's business. As colleagues have said through the webinar, consistency is really important. It's really important that staff are alert to the teaching approaches and that everybody teaches pupils in the same way so that they can build that automaticity and have confidence and fluency in their reading. And I guess the 
The third and most important area, if we're just thinking about three key things, just it has to be training. Um, are our staff confident in teaching pupils the things they need to know so that they have that fluency and access to the wider curriculum? Uh, just to say, say there, Claire, as well, perhaps the most useful thing we can direct colleagues to in terms of, you know, those whole school initiatives and, and how you prioritise things. Our publication, now the whole school is reading, you can just Google that, everybody, uh, it will come up straight away. That sets out what we hope are some really useful examples in this space so that you can see, you know, perhaps what's happening in, on the ground in, in other schools. OK, I hope that's helpful, Claire. Lovely, that's super. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, another question that captures a lot of what people are, are popping in the chat at the moment is around how schools should manage withdrawing pupils from lessons to help them catch up with reading. So how, how is that best managed in terms of implications for timetabling and catching up on lessons that, that pupils miss? So Kirsty, are you able to answer that one, please, for us? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I suppose that the main thing is that, it, as we've heard so often through the session, it's got to be a priority because unless they're reading well, they're not going to be able to access that curriculum and they're going to fall behind not only with their English, but actually across the curriculum. So, you know, I think we also accept the challenge that that poses to leaders, given, you know, that they are inevitably going to need to miss some lessons while they catch up really urgently and the timetabling constraints that make that quite challenging. And actually, I think in terms of solutions that we've seen schools use, they do vary. And I think the reason for that variation is because different contexts that schools are dealing with, you know, the number of pupils involved that need that additional support, um, you know, the amount of staff available and that level of staff expertise. And, and sometimes, of course, those timetable constraints do really come into play there about what is possible. Um, but, you know, I think we heard from Jonathan a couple of the examples that we've seen, you know, one is to always think about what can we do in the English lessons. Perhaps in year seven, we've seen some time given to teaching reading by grouping pupils that have got those same starting points and need that same teaching together and actually addressing some of it through English quite in, and being able to do so in a really intense way. Um, and I think there's also other systems in school as well that sometimes help, like if a school um, has a regular tutor time that's used for reading, then we that's obviously a really good way for staff to be focused on teaching those pupils that need that additional help and support. Uh, but ultimately, there is going to be, you know, the occasions where pupils have got to miss other lessons. And so I think we've seen examples of rotating the subject that's been missed to be able to sort of minimise um, that, that curriculum, the implications for curriculum in other subjects. But ultimately, I think what's important is that the aim needs to be for people to catch up as quickly as possible. So that's down to the quality of that teaching that's put in place, which, of course, relies on the, the staff expertise, but also some of those things we mentioned around prioritising that additional support so that it focuses on what's most important and what's going to make the biggest difference. So, you know, making sure the fluency is there first. Um, and I think finally, just to say that, you know, in terms of inspection, because we know the context varies and different schools will have to manage this in different ways, what we're really interested to know is what's the rationale for the decisions that leaders make to manage this and what's the impact that it's having? Is it helping pupils to catch up quickly and be able to access that curriculum with their peers? Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, moving on then, we are getting a lot of questions coming into the chat bar around the best phonics programs, reading schemes, resources that schools should use and whether there are any that we would recommend or particularly direct schools towards. So Ian, can I direct that question at you please? Yeah, of course, Claire, thank you. Um, yeah, there are lots lots of resources out there. Um, and what what we would say about this really is that as we heard in the slides, it's really important. It's the it's it's the what it's the you know the the nature of the curriculum that pupils need you know where are those knowledge deficits for example so I think schools need to consider you know what knowledge is actually needed because it's really crucial um, that's a really crucial element of selecting the most effective program or the or the, or the correct resource I suppose and we do know that different programs sometimes have you know different curricular purposes so I think schools need to be clear the type of curriculum 
um, that is going to meet the needs of uh, of those pupils that are struggling with reading. So, so I think it's important to to have those considerations first. Um, and ultimately, in choosing a program, leaders will want to know, you know, will, will that program work? Will it fit in with what we're trying to achieve in our school? Will it will it fit the purpose of of, of um, you know of, of of securing the help that our pupils need? I think the other things really we heard about this as well in terms of the age appropriateness so I was part of some of the uh, research visits and some of the schools you know for example using reading books that on the cover would look like books that a 13 or 14 year old pupil would ordinarily want to read but the, 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 the text was really matching with you know the phonic knowledge for example so so but it, it was at an age appropriate level so that that's another consideration so I think I would just finish there by saying, you know, we, we don't actually, it's not for Ofta to actually recommend a specific program or, or a specific product. Um, and I th because I think there's, you know, there could be a variability in terms of how different products or different resources are implemented um, and whether they're actually effective in addressing the issues that, that individual pupils will need or individual schools would need. So, so I think it's important for, there are lots of resources out there. We can't, you know, sort of recommend a particular one, but I think it just be schools to really think about what, what would they want the resource to achieve and then do that research in terms of selecting one that will uh, enable those pupils to, to learn that reading curriculum. Thank you, Ian. That was a, a really comprehensive and clear answer. Very helpful. Um, moving on then, again, drawing out some of the main themes that are coming through the many, many questions that are, that are coming into the chat bar as we're having this discussion. So um, a, a number of colleagues have asked around if if pupils have been taught phonics, for example, all the way through their primary school career, they come into secondary school, the secondary school continues with the teaching of phonics, but it, it just isn't working. The pupils are still making limited progress in terms of de developing their reading fluency, their decoding skills. Um, when should phonics instruction cease and something else be put in its place? So, uh, Kirsty, can I ask you that question, please? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think if phonics has been used continually over a number of years and children are making limited progress, then there's some questions there, really, because we know that um, pupils do learn to read if they have the right quality and quantity of practice. So I think that I would always go back to what is it that's missing? Is it around the quality of that um, teaching that they've had or is it is it just purely around the amount of practice? Because we've heard that the curriculum needs to be the same for all pupils. There, there isn't an alternative. Um, I mean, I think, we, you know, we know that there is still some practice out there where schools do give up on phonics and decide to do something different. And that different curriculum is quite often the teaching sight words. So pupils are memorising words by sight. And of course, while it may well offer some short term success, the problem is with that, it's never going to give pupils a long term strategy to decode unfamiliar words because it's not something that allows them to be able to be independent readers. Um, you know, if you think about it, of course, it, re it requires a teacher to, to tell the pupil every single word. So it doesn't work when there's no teacher there. And also research says that it's not possible to actually learn enough words memorised by sight to be useful. I think it's about 2000 words can be learned by sight, whereas to access the secondary curriculum, you need tens of thousands. Um, and I think as well, you know, when when different approaches are used like that memorising of sight words, then it, it, it's confusing to pupils because they're unclear about what strategy do I use if I'm stuck? And that often leads to them guessing rather than knowing that it's, it's that phonics and decoding that's going to help. So, you know, as we've said a few times now, I think we've got to accept that there will be some pupils that need more practice than others. And that might be the case for some pupils with SEND, but it doesn't mean phonics doesn't work. What it means is that we've got to make really careful choices about the pedagogy to help those pupils to secure that knowledge. Um, and actually, we, we published a blog quite recently, which was about pupils with SEND that have fallen behind with reading. So again, that's worth Googling if people want to know more about that area. Lovely, thank you. I'm just watching yet more questions come into the chat. It's really super engagement from colleagues. So thank you very, very much for that. And, and Kirsty, thank you for, for that answer. So um, so again, picking up the, the themes that are coming through in the questions and also themes that came through in the questions that were submitted prior to the webinar. 
got got some um some thinking and some questions around what the most useful data would be to present to inspectors on inspection to to help us make that judgment of, of that evaluation about reading so again i wonder Kirsty, can you pick up on that one for us please of course yeah um i mean i think first thing to say is that there is no need to prove improvement through data and of course we don't actually look at internal data anyway what we are interested in though as inspectors is what is assessment information telling leaders and how is that informing decisions that are made about the curriculum so it's back to those questions that ian shared isn't it you know we'd be really interested to know how do you know who's behind with reading and how do you know precisely what it is that pupils are struggling with and then we'd want to know about, you know, um, how do you know that that additional teaching that those pupils get is actually working? So how are you checking that pupils have learned and remembered what's been taught? And ultimately, I suppose it's how quickly are pupils able to get back to learning with their peers and no longer need that additional support? That's super. Thank you. Um, re really helpful. We've got a number of questions coming in from colleagues that work in specialist settings, so in special schools or alternative provision, and they're asking us how best they can help their students who have got a range of learning needs and also maybe reluctant readers as well. So, Kirsty, sticking with you as our, as our reading expert, could you pick up on that for us, please? course um, and, I, and I think I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record here now but the curriculum for learning to read is the same for all pupils whether they are in specialist provision or whether they're in mainstream provision and you know we know that there will only be a small proportion of pupils that can't be taught to read and they you know ultimately they are on the same curriculum they're just not, not going to perhaps get to that same point uh, as others but because the curriculum is the same I think what's really important with pupils in specialist provision is knowing them as an individual and knowing about all that range of needs that they have and any potential barriers that that might present for them in learning to read because it's really a pedagogy issue when we know a child's particular needs and we know their barriers then it helps staff to think about what's the best way then to take that learning to them what will help that pupil be able to access that curriculum so I think it's really, we know the curriculum is always the same. It's about questions around pedagogy there. And, and your other part of the question was around those reluctant readers. And I, and I think, you know, we've got to accept that by that age, there will be lots of pupils which who are going to find it really difficult and, and may well not want to engage in reading because they probably feel like they've failed with it. Um, so I, I suppose it's about creating success and engineering success. So again, it's around the pedagogy that's used. So thinking about breaking things down into smaller steps and really building on what pupils already know. So knowing the starting points, helping them to move on from there, giving them the right amount of practice so that they can feel that success and the confidence, of course, that that will give them. And, and being mindful about the resources used as well so that they are age appropriate and that they don't feel too babyish. Um, and, you know, for example, some programmes um, they start by introducing quite long words, those multisyllabic words, but they're ones that are quite straightforward to, to, to blend and break down. So, you know, reading a word like fantastic rather than a word like dog or cat, you can see that that would really support somebody that's older and won't make them feel, um, you know, that, that that's a real problem for them. So I think it's just really worth engineering success and thinking very carefully about those pedagogy choices. Super, thank you. Um, sort of one, one more question that's come in from the chat, and Kirsty, if I could perhaps stay with you for this, um, and, and maybe Ian, because I know it was featured on some of the slides that, that you shared. So just if we could just clarify what it was that we said around assessment. So we've got some comments in the chat about use of reading ages and, and what role that plays, or phonics assessments and what role they play. Could we just recap? I know we covered it, but just recap for people around that, that approach to assessments. Of course, I mean, I almost see it as a sort of screening process. I think 
perhaps what schools um, benefit from doing in the, in the really good examples that we saw on the research visits was that they first and foremost found out who was behind with reading because they've already got some information that helps them with that things like you know the um, transfer information from key stage two for example or it may be that they administer a test that has reading ages when pupils enter year seven so those sorts of assessments they rank pupils they identify those pupils who are behind um, but the next stage of that process then is to think about precisely what pupils are behind with. And that's where the more fine tuned assessments come in. But of course, they won't be required for every pupil. And that's why I think it's helpful to think about a stage process. So it's about, first of all, who are the ones that we need to, to look at in a bit closer detail? And, and perhaps we need to hear them read to really get that sense of are they reading age appropriate books fluently? And if there is, um, you know that if phonics accuracy doesn't seem to be there then then phonics programs do have those assessments so it would be a case of using the assessments that are whichever uh, whichever program that you use in the school and that will help to identify precisely what GPCs they know or don't know and, and I think it's just really important isn't it to get to exactly what those knowledge deficits are so that any additional teaching can be as useful as possible because it really targets precisely what they need to know next and will help them to catch up as quickly as possible then. Deepa, that was a very comprehensive answer. I don't know Ian if you've got anything to add. Like I, was just, I was just going to come in but then Kirsty decided to uh, talk about everything that I was going to but yeah I can't talk about it Kirsty. <laughs> Sorry <Thanks> Ian. <laughs> okay. No, that, that's super. Okay, I'm aware of time then. So we've got a, a couple of minutes left. So I think probably the final question for, for today, and I do apologise if we didn't get to your, your question. We have had lots and lots and lots of questions. So we will consider how we get the answers out to some of those um, beyond this webinar, because there are some really useful points in, in the chat. But Jonathan, just as a, a final question, um, some colleagues that are asking us around how we how how they should go about developing and and successfully promoting that love of reading and you know encouraging people to want to read for pleasure whether they are people that are in the early stages of learning to read or indeed people that can read but that, that just are choosing not to um could you could you uh, finish with yeah with of course that? thank you claire we, we've come full circle really haven't we and it's nice to be uh, hopefully helpfully uh, emphasizing the, the same points I guess put simply it's it's giving pupils the knowledge and skills for word reading to help them read age appropriately that that's that's the best vehicle for helping them um, to, to then make reading a choice so that they do read for pleasure and and, and common principles there are, I suppose you know the whole school community valuing reading um, allocating sufficient time so pupils can read and, and, and using all your facilities as much as possible to make sure that it's everyone's business there you go I've said it again and that, that segues neatly Claire to to a, a, a final closing point um, with just a, a, a few seconds left everyone just just say a huge thank you um, you'll have fit this into a very busy day we're very very grateful for the time that you've given us and, and, and thank you for the support that you offer pupils across England uh, we're enormously grateful for you for your hard work so it's just left for me to thank Kirsty, Ian and Claire um, for all of their uh, wisdom and expertise today and uh, and to wish you all a, a lovely evening take care everybody and thanks for joining us this evening goodbye